What if I told you that I adore every single one of you? Color Quest community, you spoil me. Hi, this is Margaret Bird, and welcome to Color Quest. Every single one of you who joins us and leaves comments and asks questions are so appreciated by myself. I am so inspired to come back every week and share my passion with you about natural color. And today's video is extra special because we are going to be looking at hibiscus, and that is fresh hibiscus, that one of you out there in the Color Quest community was kind enough to send me. So, Marilyn, thank you. You know who you are. So how about we open up that box of hibiscus and see what beauty it will bring us in today's Color Quest video. by the generosity and kindness of so many people at Color Quest in our community. And one woman named Marilyn was kind enough to reach out to me to let me know that she has hibiscus in her garden and she wanted to share it with me. So I'm opening this box, I'm looking for hibiscus and the first thing is this amazing embellishment I mean look at that they are little thread spools and then all kinds of different fibers wrapped around I mean oh my goodness look at how beautiful that is I am so excited to have this thank you all right so <laughs> Bougainvillea oh my gosh this is such a wonderful surprise as well. She did tell me she was gonna surprise me with a little bougainvillea. I foraged and took some bougainvillea from my garden in Aruba and I did some fiber dyeing with it, both hot extraction and cold extraction. But then a few weeks ago, I had a whole video on foraging and making bougainvillea ink, which I did while I was down in Baja, California, Mexico. So this is so timely. So I'm super curious to see what color she sent. These are all from her garden. So as you might imagine, she lives in a warm climate. <laughs> we do not have these here in the Pacific Northwest, but I do like to travel where there's bougainvillea and hibiscus. Oh my goodness. <gasps> Look at this. Wow. So beautiful. Oh my gosh. So, so beautiful. Make sure to pick all of those bits up. These are treasured if you're living in a cold climate. Then I see a beautiful thing called hibiscus here. So let's open that up. Wow, okay, this is a big box. Hibiscus. So I don't know what color hibiscus she has in her garden. So this is also a big surprise for me. Today's video, I would like us to look at hibiscus that are coming fresh from a garden. I had a video where I took some fresh hibiscus from a California garden. The results were, you know, okay, but they did travel with me quite a distance, and those were more of a peach color. And then one of the first videos I did here on Color Quest was of dried hibiscus, but it was dried and processed for teas and for cooking. So these, oh my goodness. beautiful wow and so many okay so today 
we're going to put some of these into a, a pot. I actually have a couple of plans. I wanted to try a couple of different things with these. Oh look, it matches my nail polish. <laughs> so I wonder if these were pretty red. I'm guessing so, and now they've dried into this beautiful purplish color. So I'm super curious to see what we get in the dye pot. So we will move those and start testing that out today here on Color Quest. But we have a few more surprises in this box. Oh, so pretty. It's Yellow Onion that she died herself this year, Valentine's Day. Oh, I was in Baja collecting Bougainvillea that day. How sweet. It looks absolutely gorgeous. Look at that. Natural dyes are just amazing. And yes, I will absolutely. Oh, she says, sorry, no mordant. I'm not quite sure what this one is. Let's see. This doesn't feel like. <laughs> this is like Christmas. Oh, so this one says Florida. This is where Marilyn is from. Did a good job of wrapping them. <laughs> oh, look. Oh, my goodness. Look at that. It's beautiful. I am guessing that this is a shell that Marilyn actually forged for from her area of Florida. Marilyn, thank you. It's absolutely stunning and I am so excited to have this. So one thing I want to point out right now, right? Remember, and we all know this, I think, that onion skins have natural tannins. In fact, you don't need to have a mordant on your fiber when you use onion skin. It's a great first dye source because it's a lot more forgiving, right? You've got the tannins so you don't have to mordant your fiber. And you can see, I mean, look at how gorgeous this is. What a beautiful yellow. This is a great, you know, option. If you don't want to mordant your fiber, use one of these things like avocado skin, onion skin, pomegranate. Pomegranate's even used as a mordant just for that purpose as well. So these are great options. So thank you, Marilyn. Beautiful. And then, oops, a couple leaves. Gotta save those. Stevia. Oh, beautiful. There's some stevia. It smells really nice. I'm gonna... Mmm, it smells delicious. It's like a... It has a tea feel to it. But look at that. So since I really struggled with nettles, maybe stevia will be my secret green. It is springtime here, and I was thinking I should go out and try to get some of those young nettles and see if maybe the March nettles are going to give me that green. But in the meantime, thank you for the stevia, Marilyn. And thank you, Marilyn, for this beautiful and wonderful, incredibly generous gift of natural dye materials, and even some beautiful earth gifts. So lovely, so very lovely. I mean, look at that. Look how cool that is, oh my gosh. Now, onward. Let's go see what this hibiscus gives us. I don't know how much I have here, but it is somewhat of a precious commodity because I don't have hibiscus in my own garden. So first thing I'm gonna do is figure out how much I have. So we'll start by simply weighing the hibiscus. Okay, so we have an ounce and a half of dried hibiscus. Now looking and thinking about a one-to-one -one ratio, which is where you typically start, that would mean, in essence, I would only be able to dye about an ounce and a half of fiber. That's not too bad. Let's see what that is in grams. We're at 43 grams. Next up is we're going to go ahead and weigh 
the actual fiber. So, in weighing the fiber, we're going to be using the different kinds of ribbons that I have dyed here in the past. I just love these because I have all the different flavors of these and they're all different in the way that they feel. And look, and they take dye differently. So it's a good cross section of fibers. And I have silk, I have wool, and I have cotton. And I have a couple different shapes. I have this silk that's more like a tube versus a flat ribbon, for example. So I'm weighing these now. And we have three and a quarter of this, which I've chosen to dye. So I have about double what I have in terms of the dry weight of the hibiscus. So I have to make a call here. I can either remove some of this and only do one and a half ounces to match a one to one, or I can just wing it and make myself a pot of this using all of these beautiful biscuits and then see what that does with these. So let's see what I decide to do. It's always a mystery. So by now you know the drill. I could be giving you a quiz on this. I have dyed with these before with varying results. So since I have both cellulose and protein, I would typically treat them differently in terms of how I mordant them. But what I'm gonna to do today is I'm actually going to use soy milk. Soy milk as a binder. Now I've had a few people come to me and say, hey, soy milk's not a mordant. And you're right, it's not. Mordants are metal salts. Soy milk, however, is used as a binder and it can help with the bond between natural fiber and natural dye. First things first though, is we have to wet the fibers. So I just have a bowl of water here. I'm gonna put my different fibers in and I'm gonna just let these soak, probably for like an hour. So let's go ahead and prep the dye itself. Here I have my hibiscus and they are beautiful and their shape is just gorgeous. But what we're going to want to do, as with all of our dye matters, is we want more surface area. So I'm gonna go ahead and help this a little bit by taking some scissors and cutting these up so we have more surface area for the water to go in and around and hopefully extract more dye. I'm doing it with scissors, but of course you could do it with your hands. This looked faster to me for some reason. There we have it all cut up. Now since these were dried from their trip to, from Florida to Washington State, I I'm going to cover them with water and I'm just going to let them sit. I think I'll let them sit overnight just to kind of rehydrate and see if just that activity is going to bring color to the dye pot. So remember when you are making your dye pot, all you need to do is make sure that you have enough water to cover your dye matter and enough water that whatever fiber you're using is going to be able to float around easily inside the dye pot. I'm gonna add a little bit more water, even though I'm, oh, look at that. I think we're already getting a little bit of color. <laughs> even though we are dyeing very small pieces of fiber, I'm gonna add a little bit more water to it so that I can get all of these hibiscus underwater for a couple of hours overnight before we put them onto heat. Okay, I'm sorry, I just have to show you this. I just put the water in and look at that water already. Oh my gosh, look at that. 
the color has already coming out. So I'm not gonna be too terribly worried, I think, about my one-to-one -one ratio. Okay, I'm still gonna let them sit. Maybe I'll only let them sit for an hour instead. And then, gosh, look at that. Unreal, just love it. Oh, nature, you are amazing. Wow, so amazing. Thank you, Marilyn, thank you, hibiscus. So these have been sitting and soaking just to open up the pores of the fiber for about an hour. And now I'm gonna go ahead and do a homemade scour and that is using soda ash. It is very easy to make a homemade soda ash. It is baking soda on a low temperature in an oven for like an hour or two. There is a video I have in my Aruba group where I made soda ash. You can go back and look at that. It's so simple. Of course, you can buy special scour powder, but what I'm gonna do is put a teaspoon of soda ash into this pot along with my silk and my cotton. And I'm going to leave the wool behind for now. And I will heat these on a low temperature on my stove. Let that soak for like 30 minutes on a low heat. Then I'm gonna turn it off. And then once it's cooled a little bit, I'm gonna add the wool because wool and heat can create felt. These are actually felted already, but you know, let's just be safe. This is going to allow for some little additional cleaning of the fibers. I just wanna jump on here really quickly. I have the hibiscus soaking, as I mentioned, and I would normally choose to turn them on a very low heat and see what kind of color I can coax out. The color is so strong and so vivid, simply sitting in cold water. So since these are treasured, I've decided I'm not actually going to heat them up at all. I will let them steep and then I will remove them and reuse them and see if I can get a second or third exhaust bath. Not going to do all of those for today's dyeing, but it's something to keep in mind and something that I wanted to just point out that when you're in your dye studio, things change, new ideas come, you see things. So recipes are wonderful and it's fantastic to start with them, but don't be afraid to venture off of a recipe or a plan because you discover something as magical as this incredible freshly dried hibiscus that's giving me the most vivid red. Hibiscus, why are you so amazing? So we'll just stir those a little bit. We'll leave it on, like I said, about 30 minutes. Cool down, add the wool. So I've let these sit for about an hour now, and now I'm gonna rinse them out. The soy milk binder combo is basically one part soy milk to five parts water. So this particular brand I like, and because it's unsweetened, absolutely wanna make sure that you get an unsweetened soy milk if you're not gonna make it yourself. Now, I don't need a lot this time because I'm only doing my ribbons. So I'm just gonna do a cup here of soy. I'm gonna put it into my dye pot. We're gonna be soaking these overnight. Then I'm gonna be adding the five cups of water on top. So you can see that it's not a huge volume, but it'll be plenty for the ribbons and pom-poms that I'm gonna be soaking in them. Just put those in. Separate them up a little bit just to, you know, to have enough space to allow the soy milk to go soak in. You've seen a video where I 
did this and I actually did the soak three times. I'm only going to do this one time, so I'm going to let these soak overnight. And tomorrow I'm going to have them come out. I'm going to let them sit, wait for a day to cure. And then I'm just going to go straight into the dye at that point. Let's take a look at where the dye is at from its cold soak. All right, these have been sitting here in cold water for literally, I don't know, two hours maybe? No heat at all. I probably could have used half of these for what I want to do, but what I'm going to do is dye what I need in this one, and then I'm going to use this for several other projects. You can keep your dyes for quite some time. Love it. You know, bright colors, things like reds and pinks, heat can take them to a whole other place that you might not want to go. So it'll be interesting to see if this will dye the ribbon. So exciting. All right, these have been soaking overnight. So now I'm simply going to take them out and squeeze out the excess and put them out. I'm just gonna put them in a bowl and let them sit and cure. I'll let them dry and since I have some time, I'll go ahead and let them sit for about a day. If you can do it longer, fantastic. If you can't do it as long, that's okay too. Let's let these sit for about a day and then we'll try dyeing them. Don't forget the pom-poms. I just wanna say, I love pom-poms. <laughs> I never knew I would love them so much, but I actually, I've been really excited and I know that there's a big project that's gonna be coming at some point with pom-poms. Wait and see. Time to drain off the viscous flowers. I'm gonna remove them and I'm going to put these into another pot so that I can go for an exhaust bath which means all I'm gonna do is cover them one more time with water, maybe two times, we'll see, and see how much more we can extract from these petals. It's pretty remarkable the amount of dye color that we got with just a cold soak. I am gonna heat this up. Stunning color. So the fiber has had a chance to cure for about 24 hours, so it's dry again. So I'm just gonna put it into water just for really a few minutes. And that's it. We always want to put wet fiber into a dye pod. So I will go ahead and let those sit for a minute and then I will put them into the dye pot and I will put the dye pot on the stove. dye pot which is always a great thing to do depending upon what colors you're looking for and pulling these out they have a really lovely mm, I don't know what color you'd call that it's a little bit more brown than I've had with other hibiscus and part of that could have been actually that I let the heat get too hot, which is okay. It's a really beautiful color. So there is the wool. And then here are the other pieces. Yeah, it has like a dusty rose color. I think that might be a great color to describe it. And as you might expect, the wool and the silk are 
typically going to take up natural colors better or stronger. Let's not say better. It is what it is. And then I still got some really good coverage on the cotton pieces. So I'm pretty happy overall. And you know what? As with everything, I am just grateful that hibiscus is sharing this color. Every single plant, every single time, it's going to present what it presents, and that's what you need to be grateful for. So I'm going to go ahead and rinse these and then let them dry. As you know, they will dry lighter than this. We'll take a look at them and see what they look like then. Awesome, beautiful colors. Now, with this dye, I'm actually going to save it. I have a project for next week's color quest that is going to utilize this. What an absolutely gorgeous, earthy tone. So in the past when I've used red hibiscus, either in a tea form or dried petals that are meant for food consumption, the color was pinker. It got me to wondering a bit about maybe how the influence of the stems that were part of these flowers today could in fact enhance the color. Not sure. We also know that the color is highly dependent upon individual plants as well as the environments in which they grow. So, as I said, we should always be grateful for whatever color is presented to us. So again, thank you, Marilyn, for being so kind and generous. And I'm going to be using the dye from today for next week's Color Quest video. I'm also going to be using the Bougainvillea and a few other dyes to celebrate the spring and the arrival of the bunny. Yes, that's right, the Easter bunny. So I hope you'll join me next Friday when we look at some new ways to use natural dyes in order to color eggs. It's one of my favorite things to do in springtime. <laughs> so if you have kids, bring them along, or if you just like to have fun with making something beautiful with natural color, be sure to check in next Friday here on Color Quest. Have a great week. Okay. Let's see. Mm. Mm. My scissors here.